Friends, good morning. My name is Tony Sundermeyer, one of the pastors here at First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta. Welcome to this third and final hour of worship on this Lord's Day, the last uh, Sunday in January. A very special welcome uh, to those of you who might be with us for the very first time. Um, I don't normally sound like this. Um, it has progressively gotten worse uh, after each successive sermon. So say a little prayer that I can get through it. Um, or not, and you can just go home early. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it is good to be together. If you're with us for the first time, do check in. Do let us know of your presence here uh, in worship this morning. Uh, there's QR codes on the screen in the bulletin for members and regulars uh, and those first-time visitors as uh, well. A lot's happening in the life of the church these days. I encourage you to take a look at the back of the bulletin for the announcements and what's, um, what opportunities we have in ministry and mission in these days. Uh, know that you're invited to participate. Know that you're invited to lend your gifts to anything that you uh, see. Next Sunday is a very important day in the life of the church. We have our annual congregational meeting. Uh, that'll take place at 10 a.m. in Fifield Hall immediately following the 9 a.m. service. Um, we will be voting on uh, new elders and new ministry leaders and a new slate for the nominating committee. We'll also hear from our president of uh, our trustees, Florida Huff, as she brings her report on uh, our 2023 financial uh, results, our 2024 budget, our position with the uh, On The Way Capital campaign and our endowment. And that'll be the scope of the business next week. Uh, it's important for members to be there. So again, 10 a.m. in Fifield Hall, immediately following that nine o'clock service. There is no adult uh, Sunday school. There are, there, is, there are opportunities rather for children, but there are no uh, adult uh, Sunday school options. We want everyone uh, to come to uh, the meeting. As I said, there's a lot of announcements uh, that you can find in the back of the bulletin. Let me just highlight that the couples retreat has a few remaining spots. We encourage you to sign up ASAP if you are thinking about uh, going on the couples retreat to Barnsley Garden in two weekends. Want to pass on uh, the sad news that uh, a beloved member of our congregation, Sharon Hawkins, died on January the 19th. There will be a private service uh, held in the Caribbean later this spring with her family and friends. Sharon was active in the life of the church, active in our communications ministry. Uh, and she is a uh, native of the islands, and so we'll be celebrating her home, her home going uh, later uh, this spring. Um, I want to in invite uh, Carolyn Bridges up. I saw Carolyn just walk in a minute ago. Carolyn, where is, there she is. Carolyn, come on up front. As she's coming up, um, I want you to be thinking about what you were doing in 1997, Okay. She's coming up. I know some of you in the room weren't thinking at all in 1997. <laughs> but I want you to be thinking about um, what you were doing in 1997. And the reason I am asking you that is because Carolyn Bridges has been a faithful member of our facilities team since 1997, 27 years, and is retiring in just a few days. Let's congratulate Carolyn. <laughs> Carolyn, um, on behalf of the, the session, we want to thank you for your faithful service. On behalf of the whole congregation, uh, we have a, just a small token of our appreciation for you in the 27 years. We hope that in retirement uh, is everything you hope it will be and a blessing for you uh, in this season. Let's thank Carolyn one more time for her ministry and service. Friends, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us now prepare our hearts for the worship of God. Read on this calling. Read on 
is coming, freedom is coming, oh yes I know. Freedom is coming, freedom is coming, freedom is coming, oh yes I know. Freedom is coming, freedom is coming, freedom is coming, oh yes I know. Our call to worship can be found in the bulletin as we read responsively. Beloved community, let us gather in joy and gratitude, for we stand on holy ground, recipients of the precious gift of freedom in Christ. In Christ, we find liberation from the chains of sin and the shackles of despair. Christ's love sets us free. Let our hearts be lifted in praise, for in Christ we discover the true essence of freedom. Freedom from condemnation, freedom from fear, and freedom to live abundantly. We gather as a community bound by the grace that unshackles us so we may be found in service to the liberating message of the gospel as we lift our voices and hearts in worship. May we be reminded of the incredible freedom we have received through the redemptive work of Christ. May our worship be a response to the boundless love that calls us out of darkness into Christ's marvelous light. Friends, let us stand in body or spirit and worship our God.
Friends, God's power makes us strong and even helps us show up remembering that none of us is perfect and each one of us is in need of God's forgiveness and healing. And so it is always good and right when we gather together to confess our sins together before God. Let us pray. God who loves in freedom, we confess the times we have not lived as people liberated by the love of Christ, failing to extend that same liberating love to others. For the moments we have judged rather than embraced, excluded rather than welcomed, and remained silent rather than speaking in, in love, forgive us. As we acknowledge our sin to you, we thank you for the promise that in Christ we find forgiveness and restoration. Amen. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. In the boundless love of Christ, we find a freedom that transcends all sin and guilt. The mercy of God flows like a mighty river, cleansing, renewing, and setting us free. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. Today is a very important milestone for our pre-kindergartners. Today we are giving them their first storybook Bible. We celebrate this milestone in the, faith, the child's faith journey. And at this age, children are building a faith foundation that is rooted in the stories found in the Bible. First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta wants to ensure that every child who comes through our doors has access to these truths. Each year we celebrate our pre-kindergarten children in this milestone by giving them a storybook Bible as a gift from our congregation. Our hope is that families read and discover together the important messages that God shares with us, with us through this Bible. So I'm going to call each child by name. If you guys will join us and kind of make your way around all these beautiful instruments and come stand with Miss Katie and we'll give out the Bibles and then at the end you can go and sit back with your family. All the children are recognized in the back of the bulletin with their names and the services that they attended. Okay. All right. Lewis, James Crump, <laughs> Wilson McKinley Crump, <laughs> Cody Michael Gormley, Virginia Glass, <laughs> Rosalind Gruner, there she is. Come on down. Will Haley. Julian Hamilton. Sophie Hart. Hey, Will. Benji Pritchard, Come on. Baird Sumner, <laughs> it's hard to get here with all of these instruments. We've made it very hard. And then last but not least, Jack Wenzel. Come on down, Jack. Congratulations, everyone. We are just so happy that y'all are a part of this church and a part of this community. And we hope you enjoy your Bible and all the wonderful stories come pouring out of each of you. Okay? Thank you for being here. Y'all hope time to invite your seat. Oh. Wait, wait, wait. We're going to. Um. Yeah. Actually, don't go back to your seats because we're going to dismiss them to you, Katie. Yeah, so if there's other children uh, would like to participate in godly play uh, this morning, I would encourage you to make your way up front. Maybe go around this way or come up on the chancel and go around. Let's pray. God, I thank you for each of those pre-K children. We thank you for each of those children and for the gift that this church gets to participate in them knowing the stories that we find in the Bible of your love and your grace and your faithfulness each day of our lives. We thank you for the ways that these kids are going to learn these stories and even help teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. So the two scriptures that we're going to be reading together, remembering that God meets us in the reading and proclamation of God's word, even today, as long as we've been hearing God's word, let us open our hearts and our minds. 
to our scripture passages, beginning with Psalm 119, verses 41 to 48. The psalmist writes, Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Then I shall have an answer for those who taunt me, for I trust in your word. Do not take the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for my hope is in your ordinances. I will keep your law continually forever and ever. I shall walk at liberty, for I have sought your precepts. I will also speak of your decrees before kings and shall not be put to shame. I find my delight in your commandments because I love them. I revere your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. And then continuing in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 31 to 38. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, we are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are descendants of Abraham. Yet you look for an opportunity to kill me because there is no place in you for my word. I declare what I have seen in the Father's presence. As for you, you should do what you have heard from the Father. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, break open this word afresh to us this day so that we would be challenged and changed, so that we'd be more like your son, Jesus the Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. We started a sermon series uh, the very first week of January, exploring the six theological principles that rooted and grounded the faith and ministry of Martin Luther King Jr. So far, we've talked about love, we've talked about conscience, we've talked about justice, and today we are going to talk about freedom. And I want to begin this conversation around freedom by taking you to Boston, Massachusetts, that historic urban center that has been the stage for many a freedom movement. Now, I don't want to take you back to uh, 1630 when the Puritans arrived in North America in search of religious freedom, nor do I want to take you back to 1773 and that raucous Boston Tea Party, nor do I want to take you back to 2004 when the Red Sox freed themselves of the so-called curse of the Bambino and won their first World Series since trading Babe Ruth to their arch nemesis, the Yankees, in 1918. I actually want to take you back to Boston, 1951. In that year, the germination of another freedom movement continued to take theological and philosophical shape. For it was that year that Martin Luther King Jr., age 22, began his PhD work at Boston University. The young Martin had two mentors at BU, Edgar Breitman and L. Harold DeWolf. And while we don't have time 
to get into these scholars' stories, what you need to know is that Martin wanted to study with them. He wanted to study with them because they were proponents, some of the leading voices, proponents of a philosophy called personalism. And through Martin's study at Crozier Seminary, just outside of Philadelphia, and even in his time in his undergraduate years at Morehouse, this philosophy became quite compelling to him. And he wanted to study it, at least in an academic setting, and see what it had to say to theology and the current situation of the nation. Now, personalism um, has a few convictions. Uh, first and foremost, personalism asserts that the human being is a someone, not a something. That a human being is a someone, not a something. The human being is a subject, not an object. And so in that way, personalists are staunch adversaries of both Marxist ideologies and unbridled capitalism that reduce human beings, in the case of Marxism, as an object made for the state, and in the case of unbridled capitalism, as an object made for the market. The personalists would contend that the state and the market were made for human beings, not the other way around. Human beings were not made for the state or market. The state and the market were made for them. In that way, personalists are fierce advocates of the dignity of every individual person. And you see this and hear this time and time again in Dr. King's sermons and writings. Every person, he would argue, even the worst of us, has inherent dignity. King once said that every human being is an heir to a legacy of dignity and a legacy of worth. Personalism also um, emphasizes the, the interconnectedness of individuals and the idea that ethical and, and social considerations should be grounded not just in our own personal well-being, but with the well-being of our neighbor because we have this deep abiding human connection. King would often say, and some of you have this quote memorized, we're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Finally, personalism was all about freedom. It was all about autonomy of individuals while also recognizing our corporate responsibility to one another. I, I say all of this because sometimes people forget that King was an academic. He wasn't just a preacher, he was a scholar. And he was able to bring together philosophies like personalism to help shape the moral and ethical framework of the civil rights movement. He took this philosophy, he took his experience with God, he took his relationship with God, he took everything that he learned about Jesus at the Ebenezer Church just a few miles down the road and just from there a few blocks around the corner at his dining room table where he learned the ministry of Jesus. He took his experiences in the segregated South and he took the vision of what America could be as articulated in our founding documents. He put all that together and built the framework for the civil rights movement. And of course, freedom would be one of the major themes of that movement. What I'd like to do uh, for the remainder of the sermon is offer a few reflections on the theological principle of freedom. And I began the way I did because I want you to know how much Dr. King has shaped my own reflections on the theology and philosophy of freedom. I've been studying King as an academic since my days at Princeton Seminary. I continue to do so uh, today. And what you'll hear is so much of it has been shaped by his own academic work and the way that I want to integrate it into my own ministry and my own life. So we have that idea, that especially around personalism. Uh, but we also have reflections, more contemporary, modern reflections on the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament and our own experience of freedom and what it means in a theological and philosophical way. And so what I wanna do is I wanna offer brief reflections on three senses of freedom. Three senses of freedom. 
First, I want to speak about freedom in an interpersonal sense. In an interpersonal sense. Then I want to talk about freedom in an ethical sense. And then finally, I want to close with a, a f- reflection on freedom in the redemptive sense. The redemptive sense. So first, the interpersonal. You and I are free. We are free to embrace our own dignity and our own worth. We have the freedom to do that. We also have the freedom to reject it. We have the freedom to embrace our own dignity and worth. We also have the freedom to reject it. In addition, we have the freedom to embrace the dignity and worth in other people. We also have the freedom to reject the dignity and worth in other people. That's what I mean when I talk about the interpersonal sense of freedom. Genesis tells us that we're created in the Imago Dei, the image of God. And that declaration appears just 27 verses in the canon of the scriptures, in the very first book of the Bible, Genesis 1. And it's always been striking to me that the first thing we learn about humanity is that we're made in the Creator's image. That's the very first thing we learn. Before we learn ourselves to be disobedient through the Adam and Eve story, before we learn ourselves to be resentful, bitter, murderous, violent people, the Cain and Abel story, before we learn ourselves to be sinful at heart, that story about the wickedness of the world and the great flood, we learn ourselves first to be made in the image of God. And that is not an accident. That is not an editorial mishap. It's intentional. It's the first word about you. And it's the first word about me. That we're made in the image of God. I I just want to invite you to let that sink in. Maybe in a spiritual way. Make yourself vulnerable. To let that wash over your mind and your body and your soul. Let it work on you. Let it mute every self-hating word that's rattling around in your brain right now. Let it erase every line of self-contempt that's written on the ledger of your heart. Let it send to hell, and I mean that. Let it send to hell every instance of self-rejection, of self-sabotage, and self-loathing. Let it annihilate every impulse in you that wants to choose toxic people because you don't believe you deserve a healthy relationship or to be authentically loved. The first word about you and me is the most important word, that we are made in the image of God. And we are absolutely free to embrace that image or to reject it in ourselves and in our neighbor. This is freedom in an interpersonal way to exercise and to live into the freedom to embrace our dignity and embrace the dignity of others. Second, I would suggest that you and I are most free when we are bound to God. That you and I are most free when we are bound to God when we are found in service to God's righteousness in the world. And that's what I mean when I say an ethical sense of freedom. When Jesus said in John 8, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed, we have to know that he's speaking about freedom in a double movement. And the first movement is a freedom from something. And in this case, it's a freedom from sin. Sin is that which impedes our ability to love God to love our neighbor, and to love ourselves. And when you give your life over to Christ, when you surrender yourself to his grace and mercy and forgiveness and love, when you invite him to take up residence in your heart, you become his servant, and you're no longer a slave to sin. You are free. It no longer holds power over you, for if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. You're free from the love of sinning, from the consequences of sinning, and from the power of shame and alienation and loneliness that so often 
holds over us. Now, I call it the ethical sense of freedom because it's not just that we're free from something, but we're also free for something. We're, we're free for God. We're free to belong to God, to serve God, to walk with liberty, as the psalmist says, in God's word, in God's statutes and precepts. We're bound to God. We're bound to God's word, which expresses God's righteousness in and for the world. Paul says this in Romans 6, We have been set free from sin and have become enslaved to righteousness. The idea here is is that we've been free for something. To be enslaved to righteousness means to freely choose our place and our role as ethical and moral actors in the world. That we use our freedom to choose the moral and ethical way of Jesus. That's why it's the ethical sense. We're free from sin, but we're free to choose this way of righteousness. This sense that we are moral and ethical actors in service to the righteousness of God. Third and finally, and I'll end with this. You and I are free to embrace the truth that in so many ways we're actually not free. We're free to embrace the truth that in so many ways we're not free. But even so, we have enough freedom and enough grace that we can co-create with God and co-create with the community a future that's distinct from the past. It's a hard truth to acknowledge that there are some ways that we are not free. For example, you and I are not free to dispossess the biology and the chemical and neurological constructs that make up our physicalness in this world. We're not free from the nature of the environment in which we were raised. We're not free from the people who raised us, who gave us good gifts, and who took stuff away. We're not free from that past. We're not free from the genetic code that's embedded in our DNA. And ultimately, ultimately, and I think this proves the point, You and I are not free from the inevitability of our own demise. In other words, you and I are not free to choose not to die. As I said, this is a hard truth, but the fact of the matter is is that we are not as free as we think we are. My father uh, was born in abject poverty in the Kensington neighborhood in the city of Philadelphia. Today, Kensington is considered the meth capital of the world, but even back in the 40s and 50s, it was a tough place to grow up. My father was one of 10 children born to Norman and Heather Sundermeyer. And what you need to know about my grandfather is that he was a tyrant. He was a tyrant. He was an adulterer. There are numerous accounts of him taking off for the weekend to spend it with a mistress coming home on Sunday night, trying to get into the front door, my grandmother meeting him there with a pan in her hand, chasing him up and down the block while the neighbors laughed and the children cried. My grandfather was also physically and emotionally abusive. And that abuse was principally directed at the fourth child. And psychologists would have a field day with this. The fourth child is the one that carried his name, my father, Norman. When my dad was six or seven uh, years old, he shared a bed with three of his siblings. And one night, as children sometimes do, he soiled the sheets, he wet the bed. The other two siblings woke up feeling the moisture and made a noise, and this enraged my grandfather. He came into their room And when he found out that it was my dad that wet the bed, he beat him and then locked him in a different room, almost like a closet in the house with just one window, basically for the whole summer. That was his punishment. When the family cooked out in the backyard in those summer months, his brothers rigged a string to the window in that room where my dad was being punished and they tied a hot dog and a bun to the string and my dad was able to raise it to his window. An act of mercy and grace by his siblings in a home that was mostly void of it. Here's the thing. 
As my father came of age and entered adulthood, he was not free from the trauma he experienced as a child. He was not free from sharing the same DNA with a tyrant father who possessed a paltry capacity for empathy. He was not free from growing up in an environment that wasn't safe and that did not have his best interests in mind. He was not free from the pain and the abuse and the scars and the self-doubt and the heartache of his childhood. And the truth is, the hard truth is, neither are we. Neither are we. None of us is free from the good, the bad, and the ugly of our past. And we have to admit that if we want any shot at redemption. What is more, redemption, I think, is realized when those patterns of abuse or harm or low empathy or whatever it is for you stop with us. In other words, when they end in our generation and they die with the previous one. You know, in Jesus' ministry, the very first word he speaks is the call to repentance. The Greek word is metanoia. It means to literally turn around and go a different way. And one of the profound gifts of Christ's grace is that he frees us and empowers us to go a different way, to tell a different story, to make different choices. So with what freedom you do have, exercise it, turn around, and go a different direction. In my father's case, he chose fidelity and faithfulness to my mother for the 21 years they were married. He chose to be a loving and kind father who did discipline me and my brother, but did it in a way that a kind and loving father should. He chose to cultivate a spiritual life and an authentic relationship with Christ. He chose to die with dignity and bravery and courage and love when cancer ravaged his body. And most importantly, why I tell you this story is he gave me and my brother a gift. He leveraged what freedom he did have to create a future distinct from the past. In his free choice to travel a different direction away from the tyranny of his father and away from the trauma that he caused, my father became a different person, a different man. By Christ's grace, he turned toward a more excellent way, and the world has never been the same. So to all of you who know you're not free from the trauma, the disappointment, the shame, the regret, the past, to all of you who know that you're not free from the root cause of your sleepless nights or your loneliness or your ambivalence or your fear, to all of you who know that you're not free from the legacies and experiences left to you. Know you have freedom. By God's grace and with the support of the church, you have freedom to create a future distinct from the past. So may we exercise our freedom to embrace our dignity and our worth and the dignity and worth in others. May we embrace our freedom and our responsibility to show up in this world as moral and ethical actors for the righteousness of God. And may we show up using our freedom to choose a more excellent way, even to create a future distinct for the pa from the past. That's my hope and my prayer for my life. It's my hope and prayer for your life, for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the world. May that prayer come true. Amen. Will you pray with me? God, as we hear these words, help us understand and embrace them and welcome them. I have freedom to embrace that I'm created in your image, that you've stamped the Imago Dei in me. And I can think of a thousand reasons why that shouldn't be or isn't true. 
but instead, God, help me, help all of us to embrace the truth that we are image bearers of the Most High God, the God of the universe, and let that shape and form who we are. God, for the freedom from sin secured in Jesus Christ and the cross and the resurrection, help that not be just a story but help me really believe and embrace and live that truth that I'm a forgiven child of the Most High God and that you robe me in your righteousness to live a moral and ethical life, not of my own making, but of your guidance and your leading and your shaping and your forming. And help me as I seek to live as a faithful disciple, God. Help me to acknowledge my past, but to know there's a freedom in the future, the future to which you call, the freedom to which, the, the call to which you have shaped and formed for each of us. Oh God, help us live as your children, as your faithful children, as your forgiven children, as the image bearer children you created us to be and redeemed us to be. Help us live our faith each day. To live it in our families and our homes and our schools in our jobs, in our communities and around the world. Not for our sake, but for your glory and for your honor. Help us as a church to embrace that and to be faithful in this community and around the world. Help us to see the many ways that you're working. And we do pause and pray, God, for a world that is struggling to understand and embrace those truths. So we pray for your peace to rain down. We pray for your kingdom to come in so many broken areas of our world. Each of us, God, has a family member or a friend or a neighbor or a classmate who's sick or hurting. Maybe it's us, but we lift our prayers before you, knowing that only in you do we find healing and hope and a way forward. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit that walks with us each day and help us to walk with the Spirit today and tomorrow and this week and in the days ahead. We make our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ as we pray together the prayer that Jesus first taught to his disciples, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we continue to be so grateful for your generous support of sharing and giving what God entrusted to you and asks, instructs to give back. So may we with cheerful hearts worship God as we bring to him our tithes and our offerings.
Will you pray with me? God, for grace, for amazing grace, we give you thanks. And as we give this offering, we pray that your amazing grace will bless it and multiply it and use it to feed and nourish and sustain ministries in this church, in this city, and around the world. And may it all be for your glory. In Christ we pray. Amen. Let us use our freedom to embrace our dignity and value and embrace the dignity and value in others. May we use our freedom to turn from sin to the righteousness of God so we become moral and ethical actors for the righteousness of God. And may we recognize the places where we are not free and even so use the freedom God has given us by grace to create a future distinct from the past. You and I are free, for if the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. And may that sun's peace, a peace which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. May it live inside of you this day 
and every day ahead. Amen, and go in peace.